Welcome to this virtual space as we begin another lesson in theories of personality, our lecture rather. Today we're going to talk about Karen Harney. So a warm up, warm up activity that I think would um, enhance the learning from this lecture are these two reflection questions. How do you define a feminist? And what is your comfortability with feminine energy? I challenge you to explore your answers to these two questions um, and in your leisure time, once you've explored your answers to those two questions, exploring more about Karen Harney, um, which we'll briefly you know, discuss, but her feminist theory uh, or psychology, feminist psychology that she is known for. All right, so Karen Harney. I think um, it is important to understand or to be aware that with every theorist, um, they come to their theory of self, which in turn is how we see others, right? Is from their own upbringing. Um, and so things that influence, uh, they are heavily influenced by what type of family, of origin they came from, culture that they were raised in, community, uh, region of the globe where they were raised. So all of these things play a role in the theorist um, theory on personality. And you will find that with, with each theorist that you study. And it's no different with Karen Hornet. She was a second born and felt neglected um, her parents were extreme opposites, which would have been interesting to hear more about from her, how that played out in the home. Um, her father was very religious and domineering and her mom was spirited and free, a free thinker. And so um, I'm curious, that's probably the, the counselor or therapist in me, how that played out. Um, she also envied her brother because he was male which kind of gives you insight into the fact that the male, um, the male was prized in the home. And um, that is not surprising seeing that her father was very domineering. And so he seemed to have been overly in tune with the male energy within him, which is an unbalance because we have both. We have a masculine energy and we have a feminine energy within us as individuals. She felt rejected by her parents. Um, she became ambitious and rebellious. She became successful in her career. She uh, studied Freudian psychoanalysis, but later turned to self-analysis um, Self-analysis basically means where she began to reflect on her own life and um, perceptions um, and perspectives that she was gathering and form, formulated a theory around that, which is what we actually all do at some point, right, or in some degree which is natural, I feel, where we look at life um, through our lens and our experience and we formulate an ideal about self and an ideal about others. So Harnay felt like childhood need for safety was a big factor, our foundation in um, an individual's uh, ideal or an individual uh, theory of self. She felt like the social forces in a childhood influenced personality. And what she means by so social forces is that, you know, there are demands placed on you from parents, expectations, siblings, you know, also can, you can feel some sense of expectation, uh, your school, um, if, if you come from a religious home, your, your religion, 
um, your community. And so all these different areas, these social forces on a child, um, if they are not, if they don't feel like their safety need is met while they are um, developing around all of those expectations, she feels like it affects the personality. Ways in which parents undermine a child's security. So she, she believed that parents played a significant role in a child feeling safe. safe. Um, again, you will notice her theory is influenced by her upbringing, you know, where she mentions the obvious preference for a sibling or unfair punishment and erratic behavior or breaking promises. Um, and so when we were reviewing or when we were going over um, her family of origin and she was describing or it was described her, her parents, you can see where this kind of plays out. The obvious preference for a sibling. Remember she envied her brother, unfair punishment and erratic behavior. Remember she, her father was um, domineering and her mom was free spirited, which actuality can also play a dynamic, dynamic with erratic behavior as well. And with the breaking of promises, um, which at times are not intentional, but if you're a free thinker and you're a free spirited, you may make a promise one day and then the next day it's, it's changed. And so for a child in need of safety, she's saying that this can affect personality. She also continues to talk about how ridicule and humiliation or isolation from peers, um, infants helplessness, these are all things that can affect one's personality that are centered around a child feeling safe. Basically, if I, her theory is that if a child does not feel safe in the environment that they're being raised in, it influences the personality or it impacts the personality. And so from that, when a child does not feel safe, right? Um, and their safety needs are not met, are they are, damaged from the areas that we were just talking about, you know, if they felt ridiculed or if the promises weren't kept, um, if the social forces around them were too strong. She feels like basic anxiety is basically what develops from that, the foundation of neurosis. And I'm just gonna read her quote. She says, basic anxiety can be roughly described as a feeling of being small, insignificant, helpless, deserted, or endangered in a world that is out to abuse, cheat, humiliate, betray, envy. And special in this is the child's feeling that the parents love their Christian charity, honesty, generosity may be only a pretense. I um, chose this quote because I feel like this does a very good job of summing up how she viewed herself in the world from her um, influences from the home she was raised in and the community environment she was raised in. And so you can see, she sees the world as a very unsafe, untrusting place um, and that parents are not really sincere and authentic in their love and care for you as a child. And because of this, if, if this is a experience that one has, then a neurosis would, would form on personality. Like there would be a um, abnormality in the personality because of this. Neurosis basically means that I have learned unhealthy views or thoughts on how to obtain my needs to, in order to be well, are to live well in society. That's what neurosis basically means. And psychotic or psychosis means I have um, irrational or delusional thoughts and beliefs on, on how my life should look or be in order to live well in society. So that's kind of like a very condensed definition of neurosis and psychosis which is something that is more talked about um, in a 
abnormal psychology course um, or when you uh, get into grad school, looking at courses like study the DSM um, or clinical assessment. These are courses where you would dive a little bit more into the understanding of neurosis, psychosis, um, and what a normal, healthy, what normal, healthy behavior looks like, which is really, you know, sidebar, what really is normal versus abnormal, right? Like there are things that I may do that may seem abnormal to someone um, and vice versa. Uh, I think that culture, which is why culture is so, or an understanding and appreciation and respect for culture diversity is so important. Um, when we're talking about these theories on how personalities are developed and when we're talking about abnormalities. And I know I went a, a little off on a sidebar there, but I think it's important to mention. Okay, so self-protective mechanisms against anxiety. So she felt like um, one would naturally develop these self-protective mechanisms are that we all have these self-protective mechanisms that we use when we feel threatened. And um, these, the, the self-protective mechanisms that she, um, that she talks about is securing affection. And securing affection would be um, when we talk about, you know, people pleasers, or sometimes you hear the terminology doormat, like don't be a doormat for, for that person, or codependence. Um, these are some of the ways that the unhealthy way of securing affection can happen when this is a self-protective mechanism because of like, anxiety. Being submissive, um, attaining power, which would be the opposite. Uh, that would be more like that narcissist, uh, behavior or, or personality traits that you hear about are withdrawing, um, becoming a hermit and isolated um, to protect yourself. So she felt like we all have neurotic needs um, and neurotic needs basically are just needs that need to be met in order to live well. And she felt like they fell into these three categories, needs that move you towards others, needs that move you away from others, or needs that move you against others. Um, and so the 10 neurotic needs that um, we're gonna just briefly talk about in the next slide, she felt fell into one of these categories. And again, in her theory, if, I have not formulated a healthy ideal of self or a healthy concept of self, then my way of trying to accomplish these um, or obtain these neurotic needs um, would look unhealthy. And also when she talks about these three categories that they can fall into, that would look unhealthy too. Like the way that I move towards others would not look healthy and et cetera, et cetera. So the 10 neurotic needs, um, I'm not gonna read over all of them. I'll just pull one of them and um, kind of give you an example of what she means by uh, when it, when an unhealthy, because of the lack of child safety needs, right? Where I didn't feel like my needs, my safety needs were met when I was young um, and how that formed basic anxiety um, and how that influenced my personality. And so I'm gonna give you an example of how that theory plays out with one of her neurotic needs. So I'm gonna choose the one, hmm, let me see. The neurotic need for personal achievement. I'll use that one, the neurotic need for personal achievement. And so when she talks about that basic anxiety, right, that forms, uh, which is the foundation of neurosis because of the lack of safety in childhood, which creates the, the anxiety. Okay, so an example of that, if we were to go back to this need, that would kind of, that could, the, hold on, let me go back. So the neurotic need for personal achievement, um, it could actually fall into 
either one of these categories on how you go about doing it, right? So I'm going to choose the one because it's obvious how that plays out in needs that move you against others. We've seen that played out often in movies when you're the one that's trying to be the, you know, on top and how getting on top, you don't mind smashing other people down. So, but I'm going to use the example of needs that move you towards others. And so how that would look um, and trying to achieve personal achievement may be you, you may be manipulative and conniving. Um, you may play on people's emotions um, to get what you need. Um, you may be an opportunist. Um, these are some examples. And we've actually, I've seen that in movies play out as well. I, I love using movies. This is another sidebar. I love using movies, using movies in the classroom setting around psychology topics because there's so there's so many things that you can kind of see how you know the writer and the director is uh their concept of it and it can be analyzed and discussed in a classroom setting but anyway these are some examples of how um in an unhealthy way one would try to achieve this neurotic need And so she felt like there was a conflict within self, right? Which was another core of neurosis. And so like, because of the lack of safety I felt as a child, which created basic anxiety, right? Um, now I, am, I have formulated unhealthy ways of trying to obtain those neurotic needs, right? And so it becomes an incompatibility of the neurotic trends. Um, a neurotic person has one dominant trend battles to keep the non-dominant trends from being expressed. And so basically what she's talking about is like, I battle within myself because I don't have a, a true, um, because I don't have a comfortable concept of myself, right? I battle with how I get those neurotic needs met, those 10 neurotic needs. And I, I, I sway back and forth within any of those three categories, but I have one dominant one that I my that would be my preference. Whether if it was to move towards others or against others, like I have a dominant preference trend, right? And I battle to keep that non-dominant one from being expressed. So, for an example, if my dominant trend was to move away from others, then I am. I feel uncomfortable when the other one of moving towards others has to be utilized or um, practiced. And hopefully that gives you a um, understanding of that concept of this conflict within self. Um, when we talked about Carl Jung, you know, he talks about that conflict within self, right? Um, he talks about how there's, you know, your shadow, um, your real self and then there's the persona right like we wear the mask right and so this is kind of similar to what she's talking about so she felt like we have like the idolized self-image and that there is the real self which is what i would coin the authentic self i coined it the authentic self because this is the self that is the all of my flaws and all of my beauties all in one, right? Like my strengths and my weaknesses. Like I am fully aware, fully comfortable, accepting and kind and non-judgment of, of who I am, my good and my bad. Um, sometimes I like to use the protons and the neutrons in me um, and electrons, right? Um, when you think about protons, neutrons and electrons, they simply are positive, negative and neutrals, right? And so this is the real self. The ideal self would be who you strive to be, right? Like who, and, and this ideal self, if I have formed an unhealthy personality because of, you know, according to Horne's theory, not felt safe growing up and, I cre and it created anxiety, right? Excuse me then my ideal self may be based on unrealistic expectations. And um, that can be a turmoil within myself. 
Then she also feels like there's the actual self and the actual self varies, right? Because the actual self is who I am at any given moment. Um, and so in some moments I can be showing off my strengths at other moments, it could be my negative parts of myself at other moments I can be neutral. And so like, these are the three um, areas that she feels like are that play out in someone within someone. And so I think this chart does a good job of kind of giving you a visual of that. So like a normal, a healthy individual, their real self and their ideal self would um, interlap and would be compatible to one another. And what I mean by that is my real self has realistic expectations for my ideal self. And so an example of that would be like if I know that my strength is public speaking for an example, then my ideal self of doing well in a public speaking presentation would not, um, or actually, let me, let me reverse that and say, if I know that my strength is not public speaking, let me use that one. I know that my strength is not public speaking and my ideal self still wants to do very well in this public presentation or that public speaking presentation that I have to do, then I have realistic expectations um, of that. And so neurotic would be when they are extremely opposite. They're like almost bipolar of themselves. There's not a real awareness of my real self and my ideal self, which is where um, in Adler's theory, you know, where he talks about the inferiority complex and the superiority complex can play a role you know, can come into factor because like, I'm trying to achieve this ideal self that is so far-fetched from who I really am. So I think this is a good activity to do in exploring yourself and your ideal self. Um, as I've mentioned before, when studying theories of personality, the best way to really understand the theory is to understand yourself. Um, and in understanding yourself, you can understand how other theorists understood themselves and in turn understood the world around them. And so this activity requires you to think about three destinations, your intellectual self, your emotional self, and your bodily self. And to sum up the ideal male or female according to society or the media in those three areas and then compare it to your ideal of self and to see if, if there's any similarities or differences in that. And I think that this is, um, again, a good activity in helping you see where are you with your awareness of your real self to this ideal self, right? Like, are they compatible or are they on opposite ends of the spectrum? Okay, so when we began this lecture, I talked about the warm up activity to explore your thoughts um, and opinions on what it means to be a feminist and also how comfortable are you with your feminine energy. Um, and so I, I talked about how that warm up activity was a good um, segment into Karen Hornet because she talks about feminine psychology. And in feminine psychology, she in feminine psychology, she basically took Freudian's theory about a woman having male, uh, penis envy and said, well, males have womb envy. Um, and she felt like male envy toward women due to her capacity to, for motherhood. And I thought that that was, <laughs> I found it rather funny and she was like, oh, you think we're jealous of you? No, you're jealous of us. When, I mean, there's probably room to talk about, there's probably room in the middle to kind of reflect on how maybe both of them are true. She felt like women um, battled with these feelings of inferiority because, um, of the restraints that society are the limits that society attempts to put on women and what they can or cannot do. 
Um, and she felt like that became a complex within the psyche of a woman. Um, she reinterpreted the situation of the um, Oedipus complex, which Freud talks about um, where the male is jealous um, of the, where the, the male child is jealous of the father because he has a sexual desire for the mother. That's Freudian's um, concept of this complex. She removed the sex from that and reinterpreted it as an erotic conflict between dependence and hostility towards parents. So basically what she did was she looked at that complex and said, oh, well, I don't think it's about sex and wanting to having a sexual desire for the parent, but more so of just this struggle, this um that happens within oneself right as they're trying to gain dependence um and become their own person she also felt like motherhood our career were like these dynamics that are this conflict that women had to choose between like what role will i choose what path what role path will i choose um and how that could that could create conflict within a woman because they may want both. And she recognized that as those social and culture forces on personality. Um, remember in the beginning of the lecture, we talked about how she felt like social forces played a role on the impact of a child feeling safe. And so if you thought of, if you think about a female growing up in a home and how those social forces and how they played out, how was the mother's role in the home? Um, how that could impact a female in her concept of self. Her questions about human nature. She had free will. She believed in free will. She emphasized uniqueness. She was optimistic. Um, she focused on the past and the present, which you see a lot in the neo-Freudian theorists. Um, Karen Horney is a, considered a neo-Freudian theorist so as Alfred Adler and Carl Jung. And um, they're considered neo-Freudian because they study from Freudian theory, but then they formulated um, more from that theory because, you know, Freudian theory was highly uh, influenced by just um, nature and that it was unchanged, but the, um, the theorists that came after him, like Adler, Young, Young and, and Horne, they began to see how, well, no, there are other, there's, there's nurture that plays a role as well. Um, there's these other factors that one is um, brought up around or that are other factors that one experiences um, that influences personality. So assessments that are used in Horne's theory is free association and dream analysis. She modified these techniques because these are techniques that Freud, a Freudian approach utilizes as well. And free association, she focuses on the visible emotional reactions. And so basically what that means is as she's doing free association, which is just allowing the loose tongue, just allowing the person to just talk, she's focusing on how they are emotionally responding or reacting to that. And with dream analysis, she felt like when an, uh, analyzing a dream, that a dream was showing one's true self, right? When we talked about the real self, she felt like that the dream was revealing to the person who their true self is. Some other assessments used in Horne's theory is the um, compliant, aggressive, and detached personality types. Um, it's the 35 item self report inventory um, that measures neurotic needs, and as well as the Horne Coolidge type indicator. And so, some research um, from Horne's theory a lot of her research, again, was heavily influenced by case study. Her focuses in her case studies were on the neurotic trends that we talked about, those 10 neurotic trends and how they fall into those three broad categories. The feminine psychology, um, where we talked about um, those social forces and how that can create 
you know, that anxiety, right? And that conflict within self, um, the tyranny of the should, um, which that's the ideal self that we battle for, right? Um, the neurotic competitiveness, the need to win at all costs. Um, these are some of the things that she focused on in her case studies research. Some results on Harnay's research um, were, are um, the aggressive neurotic trend. She found that people who score high on that may not perform well in school, may have mental health issues, are more likely to major in business. <laughs> and I thought that that was interesting because when you think about, again, if we're talking about how, you, how movies are um, a lens into uh, a, a practical way of looking at how these theories play out in the real world. I, I, the first movie that came to mind when she was like, are more likely to major in business was um, Wall Street. And because there was a lot of that, right? That masculine, overly emphasized masculine energy, which is often, um, often part of aggressive neurotic trends. Some other results on Harney's uh, research is the neurotic competitiveness. And people who score high tend to be neurotic, narcissistic, um, authoritarian, and low in self low in self-esteem. So critique, you know, what are your thoughts on Karen Harney? Uh, does any of her theory resonate with you? What are some positives, what are some negative things that you see in her theory? I think it's important to not look at these theories as law, but to explore them all kind of like from an eclectic point of view um, and analyze from your own perspective, matching it against your own experiences in life. And then once you do that, then you're able to apply it in your own unique way in a counseling setting um, and learn how to apply it in your own unique way in a counseling setting. Um, for those of you that are still in school, it, school is our hmm, graduate school, our undergraduate school is where you should be if you are interested in going into the clinical aspect of the field where you should be beginning to kind of formulate what naturally you're gravitating to and why. Um, and that may change and evolve, of course, as you continue to matriculate and grow and, and life and experience new things. But that's, this time is a time for you to be able to see, okay, how, how can I apply this? How would I practically apply this theory in a counseling setting or just in the helping profession in general? This is a video demonstration of um, Hornet's feminist theory um, in a therapy session, which you can find or which can be located on YouTube. So I'm not going to play it in this lecture. All right, so reflect. Um, reflect on the lecture. Reflect on what you understood, what you didn't understand. Seek, seek more or greater understanding of the areas that um, were not as clear to you. And that is the end. Have a good day.